The Lord be with you. And And also also with with you. Hear this call to worship from Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for humankind. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your story and for your story that is at work here in this place and in each one of our lives. For the story of redemption that we'll see when we gather around the font this morning and for that story that we sing about every time we gather on Sunday. Thank you for hope and joy and peace, for your presence in our lives in times of struggle. We pray that you will continue to write your story on our hearts and that our lips will always tell the story of your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
morning, and welcome to Plymouth Heights Christian Reformed Church. It's a joy to be able to welcome you here in this place, whether you're gathered right here um, in this physical location or whether you are joining us online. Um, if you're visiting, we extend a special welcome to you, and we look forward to getting to know you after the service. Now receive God's greeting this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. As God has welcomed us here in this place, please welcome those around you. Good morning. Good morning. and April Wong are presenting their daughter Praise for baptism. In a few moments, they will come up here and, and join me at the font to make their promises here. And the congregation will respond by making promises back to them and in God's presence. But what's beautiful, maybe uniquely so, about this baptism is that you've already lived into that covenant reality. Nine months ago, Praise was born in a very fragile condition with congenital heart defects. Even before her birth, some of you were praying for her well-being. And then shortly after her birth came that 10-hour surgery. And you signed up in great number to pray her through that time. There was about a 48-hour period of time that we were told was particularly critical. And so we had a big sign-up genius um, made by her deacon and covered 48 hours continuously in prayer. Your prayers and your love have carried this family, and we trust that that prayer and love will continue to carry them and their daughter praise. Jesus invites us to that kind of loving community, and, and he did that with his disciples as well. He invited them to follow his example of love. And then Jesus left his followers with this command. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them 
in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Join in this prayer. God, your promise to be with us to the very end is such a comfort to us. We marvel at your goodness and compassion when we see a new baby and when we gather around the font. Perhaps your goodness and compassion seems especially strong today as we baptize praise. She's already experienced so much in her short life, and we know there may be more surgery and more health challenges in her future. But today, we entrust her to your care and to your tender mercy. As we listen to the promises spoken here at the baptism font, may we hear anew your promise to each of us to never leave us or forsake us. And as we hear that, may we renew our promise to you. We love you, Jesus. Help us to love you more. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's recall together what the Bible says about the sacrament of baptism. The water stands for two things. First, the washing away of our sin by the blood of Jesus, which brings renewal in our lives through the Holy Spirit. And second, it reminds us that, each, that we are buried with Christ in his death so that we could raise with him in resurrection. Baptism also reminds us that we've been adopted by God as his children. It's God's way of sealing his covenant with us, his children. And God includes our children today just as he included the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Jesus told the adults around him that the kingdom of God belonged to such as these. Stone and April, since you are presenting praise for baptism, we invite you to come forward and answer these questions. Can you come up here? First, do you confess that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, accept the promises of God, and affirm the truth of the Christian faith, which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? Second, do you believe that praise, though sinful by nature, is received by God in Christ as a member of his covenant family and therefore ought to be baptized? And third, do you promise, in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Christian community, to do all in your power to instruct your daughter in the Christian faith and to lead her by your example to be Christ's disciple? Stone and April, what is your answer? We do. God protect us. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive praise and love? Pray for her. Help instruct her in the faith and encourage and sustain her in the fellowship of believers. Congregation, what is your answer? Jesus said, let the little children come to me, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. You can come right up here. Praise Wong. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we practiced this when you were at my house the other day, and it didn't go so well. So I'm going to let you stay right there in your dad's arms while I give you the blessing. Praise. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace today and every day of your life. And God's people said, I have a certificate for you to mark this day, and, and it has a book in there as well, reminding praise of the promises of God. Oh, baby. 
Wireless 2 is up and running. Here we are. Hello and good morning. It's been a few weeks since you've seen us up here. So in the summer, our children's program downstairs called Sunday Stations only meets twice a month. So you'll see us here this week and next week. We're working our way through stories about Paul. And so I thought this morning I would read the story that we're going to talk about more downstairs. And what I want you all to do is every time you hear the word light, I want you to raise your hands up and make some light. How's that sound? Okay? Yeah? I think you got it. Okay. Practice. Let's do it. Light. Woo! All right. And the congregation, you can join as well. We would love to see your participation. All right. From Acts 9. I'm so smart and important, Saul thought. Congregation, I will need you now, since I'm not down there. Saul thought as he traveled to Damascus that he was so smart and important. Saul was a well-known Jewish religious teacher, and he was very proud. He was also someone who was feared by those who followed Jesus, the light of the world. Woo. On this trip, like so many times before, he was on his way to get rid of people who followed Jesus, the light of the world. But God had other plans. Suddenly, a bright white light shot from heaven and blinded Saul. I can't see. The light is too bright. Saul yelled as he stumbled to the ground. Saul, why do you hate me? said a deep, booming voice. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, the light of the world. The voice answered, go to the city of Damascus and wait for me there. Saul waited in Damascus, terribly afraid and unable to see because of the light. But Jesus did not leave him without help. He sent his friend Ananias to Saul. Lay your hands on him, Jesus said. I want Saul to see and be filled with my Holy Spirit. So Ananias put his hands on Saul's head. Something that looked like fish scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. All at once, Jesus' spirit filled his heart with love and joy. Saul, the one who hated Jesus, the light of the world, became one of Jesus' most famous followers, the disciple named Paul. All right, gang, let's stand on up and we'll receive the blessing. Thank you, congregation, for your participation. People of God, what is our prayer for these children?
Join me in the prayer of the church. Eternal God, Alpha and Omega, our A and our Z, you were there when our life began, and you will be there when our life comes to an end. Wherever we are on the journey of our existence, you are always with us. Thank you for your abiding presence. God, you knit little praise in her mother's womb. You sustained her during an early delicate surgery, and we know that you will be with her for her through further medical tests and procedures. Through baptism, you have said to her, I am your father, you are my child, you belong to me. We pray for the many elderly people of our congregation. When their strength fails and their end draws near, may they be assured that you walk with them in the valley of death. In all our valleys, travel with us. We rejoice with Ted Versiput as he observes his 95th birthday this week and with Scott and Lisa in their recent marriage. Comfort Dan and Judy Johnson, their extended family, in the death of his brother Dale through chemo treatments and therapy, breathe healing and strength into Dave Veen's body. Sustain Doug Deepstra in his weakness. And please answer the prayers of all who cry to you for healing and comfort. Do more for them than they asked for or imagined. And especially, God, comfort friends and family of those shot to death in Highland Park on July the 4th. How quickly their excitement, their pleasure turned to sorrow. And now by your spirit, and over time, turn their tears into trust in you. Will you be near to our loved ones who are far away from us? To the parents and siblings of Stone and April Wong, and Jin Li and Mary Ma in China. Holy Spirit, lead them to faith in Jesus. Be close to the mother and relatives of Kumar and Krisanthi in Sri Lanka, and to our children who live not only out of town but out of state. Thank you for technology which enables us to stay in contact with them. Thank you for the many places and ways in which we find enjoyment this summer, for libraries and bike trails and flower gardens, for concerts, for beaches and lakes, for fresh fruit and vegetables, for amusement parks and museums, and the Wednesday evening community night for our children and our neighbors. And thank you for eyes to see, ears to hear, feet to walk, and mouths to taste the delights and beauty all around us. God of life, give us joy in just being alive, and above all, greater joy in being alive in Christ, our Savior and Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. The deacons will come forward and receive the offering for the Ministry of Fund and Christian Education.
pray. Faithful Father, thank you that you give the gift of abundant eternal life, for your generosity overflows to us. Everything we have is a gift from you. As we bring our offerings to you, we give back to you from the abundant blessings you have given us. May our gifts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord our God. Blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and strength be unto you, our God, forever and ever. Through Jesus, <clears throat> through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> In uh, our ref reflection on the life of David, we come today to a passage found in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 23. You can find this in your, pew, in your pew Bibles on page 454. 1 Samuel 23, I begin reading at verse 13 through verse 23. So David and his men, about 600 in number, left Keilah and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told, that David had escaped from Keilah, he did not go there. David stayed in the wilderness, strongholds, and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God had not gave David into his hands. While David was at Horash in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul saw Jonathan, went to David to at Horash, and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel, and I'll be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horesh. The Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds of Horesh on the hill of Hekelah south of Jeshimon? Now your majesty, come down whenever it pleases you to do so, and we'll be responsible for giving him into your hands. Saul replied, the Lord bless you for your concern for me. Go and get more information. Find out what David usually goes and who has seen him there. They tell me he is very crafty. Find out about all the hiding places he uses and come back to me with definite information then I will get, go with you. Is he, is he, if he's in your area, I will track him down among all the clans of Judah. This is the word of the Lord. New congregation, about eight years ago, my brother Case, younger than me, died very unexpectedly of a heart attack in Fremont. I was very close to Case, 
in terms of um, temperament and character, in terms of ministry style and outlook, we were very, very similar. He was almost a clone of me, and I was a clone of him. The visitation took place uh, the day before the funeral uh, in Fremont, where he lived and was a pastor. And who should come that day to the funeral home to visit but Lyle and Artie, a couple from 3rd CRC in Zealand, where I had just begun serving as interim pastor. And the fact that they had driven over an hour to come and just be with me for a few moments meant a whole lot to me. They showed up. I'm very sure that's how David felt even more when Jonathan came to see him in Horesh. Now, Horesh is in the southern part of Israel. It's about 20, 30 miles southeast of Jerusalem. It's in, the, in a desolate, barren wilderness area in the southern part of the country. And Horesh was somewhere in that desolate wilderness area. David had gone, gone there to escape from Saul, the king of Israel. Because ever since, ever since David slew the giant Goliath, his life, ironically, uh, was in danger. Jealous of David, uh, uh, threatened by, by, by David, who had become enormously popular in the land of Israel, Saul sought to kill David. And so David became a fugitive. He became a man on the run. Ten, ten chapters... About you, buying you, 10 chapters in the book of 1 Samuel are devoted to uh, this time in his life when David was running and run, running and fleeing and fleeing with Saul in pursuit. And, and, and 13 places or areas are mentioned by, by name, but many other places he went to that we don't know about. So in verse 13 it says uh, in the chapter that David and his men, about 600 in number, kept moving from place to place. So uh, David, uh, you know, fleeing and Saul pursuing. David uh, going here and there and Saul tracking him down. It was one huge game of cat and mouse, except it was not a game and except it lasted a whole lot longer. In the book of Psalms, many of which were written by David, or at least attributed to David, God is called a refuge 37 times. God is called a stronghold. God is called or referred to as a hiding place. Wonderful metaphors, wonderful pictures of speech. And, and I'm not surprised, are you, that this language permeates the writings, the Psalms of David. During his several years of running from Saul, David sought refuge again and again, here and there. He wanted this stronghold, that stronghold. He was looking for this place to hide and that place to hide. And nowhere where David went in Israel, outside of Israel, did he feel safe but he knew one person with whom he could always feel safe. And so he called God my refuge, and he called God my hiding place, and he called God my stronghold and my fortress and my deliverer. The language of refuge and stronghold and hiding place in the book of Psalms reflects that time in David's life when he was running from King Saul. So, so now in today's passage... David finds himself at Horesh, again to escape uh, the threatening intentions of the king of Israel. So there he is in this desert, desolate southern area of Israel, hiding, looking for refuge. To, da to Horesh, uh, David went. He was not the only one who made his way to Horesh. So did Jonathan, uh, the king's son, and David's best, most loyal friend. Jonathan went to Horesh for a different reason. 
Jonathan went to Horesh to encourage David. So he had found out, I'm not sure how, he had found out, he had learned that David was at Horesh. And he, I, I no doubt he sensed, as friends have a way of doing, that uh, this was a very difficult time in David's life, always running from King Saul. And judging by David's opening words to David at Horesh, uh, Jonathan realized that, that he was David. He was lonely. He was afraid. He was discouraged. He felt down. And he said to himself, I've got to go and see David. I've got to spend some time. I want to just be with him during this time. And so he left home. He left the palace, and he traveled to Horesh. And the Bible says this. So Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. I think that that, that is the most beautiful description. That's the most beautiful description. Uh, portrayal of encouragement. He went to David and helped him find strength in God. This wasn't a case of, you know, of, David, of, of Jonathan already being in the vicinity uh, for, for whatever reason and thinking or saying to himself, well, as long as I'm in the area, I might as well drop in and say hi to David. This was a very intentional journey on his part. He made that fairly long, I suppose, trip from the palace in Israel to Horesh in the south just for that one reason, to encourage and to be with his friend David during a very hard time in his life. And can you imagine, can you imagine what, what, what a lift that must have given David? Because when we are feeling down or blue or discouraged or disappointed, just having a person come to be with us, having somebody come alongside of us, is so encouraging. Have you heard the expression, 90% uh, of helping is just showing up. It's actually the title of a book, a small book, written by a Christian reform pastor, Jim Cock. And that title, that expression is so true. You know, sometimes when we hear of someone who, 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 close to us who, is, who, who has been afflicted by a hardship or uh, by some grave difficulty, like uh, being diagnosed with a, with a se severe illness or um, a devastating death in the family or the loss of, of an important job. When we hear about that, we, we say to ourselves, I, 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 I don't know what to say. And then sometimes because of that, we, we don't go to that person. Keep in mind that more than your words, it's your presence that matters. 90% of helping is just showing up. Like Artie and Lyle, that, that couple from Zealand, who just showed up. I, I, in Fremont, during, at the funeral home, I, I, have, I don't remember it all. I, I, I have no idea what they told me, what they said to me. But I was so appreciative that they made the journey from Zealand to just be with me for a few moments. That impressed me. They took time to come. It's our presence when a person is down or discouraged, it's our presence with that person that matters more than anything else. 
Now, we can be present in different ways. We can be present by physically being with that person or that family. Or we can uh, pick up the phone and say, I just want to see how you're doing. Or we can send a note or a card that says, you came to my mind today. I was, I've been thinking of you. That is all presence with a person in need. Early on in my ministry, I was at Seymour Church at the time. And this went on for, for, for a while. I'm not sure, maybe a few years. I included in my, in my weekly planner of things to do. Every week I write out all the things I have to do that, that, I'm, that I'm aware of. I included my weekly planner of things to do, an item that said, who can I encourage? And believe me, there is no lack of people to encourage. Like many of you, I like that song we sang before the scripture reading, what a friend we have in Jesus, with this powerful reminder to bring to God in prayer the things that get us down, the things that concern us, that worry us. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. It's so true. There is one line in that song I've never quite liked. There's one line in that song that I'm not fond of. It's the line, we should never be discouraged. And whenever I hear that line, and whenever, like again this morning, we sing that line, I say to myself, never be discouraged. We can't help getting discouraged. Everybody gets discouraged. Well, I don't see results when things don't go the way we expected. I have no doubt that Jesus was very often discouraged in his life by the, by the lack of faith, the lack of trust, the lack of, by, by the misunderstanding on the part of his disciples and followers by the, the opposition he endured from the Jewish leaders. No one is beyond discouragement. Do you know what that implies? That no one is beyond needing encouragement. David was undoubtedly just lonely, afraid, discouraged, running from place to place to place. Saw a constant pursuit of him, and Jonathan came to encourage him. Jonathan went to David at Horesh. He went there to be with his friend. And in addition, the Bible says, he did more than just show up, even though 90% of helping, that's a rough figure, uh, is just showing up, that, that, that David did more than just show up. Because the Bible adds, and helped him find strength in God. So encouragement has two components. We are with a person, we come alongside a person, that's our presence, and then we do what we can to help that person find strength in the Lord. And how did Jonathan do that? How did Jonathan help David find strength in God? Well, chiefly by reminding David of the promise of God by reminding David of the word that God had conveyed to David earlier that he would be the king of Israel. 
And so reminding David of that, Jonathan said, um, don't be afraid. Uh, my father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be king over Israel. And that is a way in which Jonathan helped David find strength in God, the promise of God, the assurance of God. You know, the, the, the word of God is, is such a wonderful uh, way by which we can encourage people. Now, I, I realize we have to be careful uh, and careful of coming up with what I call these, you know, these cheer up texts, like uh, all things work together for good, or God will never give you more than you can bear, those kinds of things. And yet, how, how helpful it is to, to lovingly, from Scripture, point out God's character, God's faithfulness, uh, God's promises, God's presence. That's how we help someone find strength in God. And, and maybe we can say, let's turn to God's word together. Together. It's also helpful uh, to read passages, especially Psalms in which the writer cries out to God in his distress. Like Psalm 13, a short psalm, in which the writer cries out to the Lord, laments. Now, now Psalm 13 ends this way. It ends with, I trust in you, O Lord. I sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. It ends on this positive, triumphant note. But, but the psalmist did not get there that quickly. He didn't get there. He didn't get to that point of, I trust in you, I sing your praise, before crying out to God. And so he says in Psalm 13, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? This man was hurting big time. And when we meet up with people who are hurting, sad, troubled, distressed. The path of encouragement starts by acknowledging that. It starts by being with them where they are, and it starts by walking with the, those people in their valley, and then acknowledging their pain, we point the way out. But scripture is so helpful. And so is prayer. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. That is so important to say, as long as it is not a cliche. And you know, you've heard it, people say it to you, I've heard people say it to me. It's very encouraging for people to hear somebody else say, I'm praying for you. And better yet, if the opportunity is there to pray not just for the person, but with the person. My point is that encouragement is not just, you know, saying to people, hang in there, the sun will come out tomorrow. But we point people to God, his promises, his character, his faithfulness, his love. I like what it says in Romans 15 that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement the scriptures provide, we may have hope. 
This is a way by which God encourages us and others, the word of God. This is a way by which we help people find strength in God. Well, back to David and Jonathan. Um, if, we, if we go simply on the basis of the biblical record, this is the, I think, I'm, I think I'm quite right, but if I'm wrong, I will give the correction next week. Uh, but I think this is the last time that David saw Jonathan. Because around two years later, Jonathan was killed in battle, and how David mourned. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, we read David's lament for Saul, surprisingly, and Jonathan. I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother. You are very dear to me. It is common nowadays at funerals for someone or someone's to make a few remarks uh, in memory of, in tribute to the deceased, uh, whether a son, a granddaughter, a friend. If David had had that opportunity, he might, I'm thinking now, I'm, I'm projecting, he might well have said, among other things, I'll never forget the last time I saw Jonathan. As a Horesh running from my life, feeling ever so low, ever so down. And who should show up? Jonathan. He'd come a long ways from home just to be with me. His coming gave me such a lift. That's what I think, that's what I think Jonathan might have said if he had had that opportunity. But we do know from scripture what someone else said in a very similar situation. So centuries, centuries later, the apostle Paul found himself a very down time in his life, low, lonely, and afraid, all by himself, in a prison, somewhere we think in Rome. And one day, the guards said, Paul, you've got a visitor. It was Onesiphorus, a person who most likely had come to faith under the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And he had heard that, that Paul was in prison and he traveled all the way, all the way from Ephesus in Turkey to Rome to be with his spiritual mentor and his spiritual father, Paul. And what a picker-upper that visit proved to be. How do we know that? Because in one of his letters, Paul wrote this, may the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of me being in prison. On the contrary, when he came to Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord have mercy on the household of Onesiphorus because he refreshed me. Now, our road to Rome will not be dramatic as that, and our road to Horesh will not be unusual as like that of Jonathan. But on a lesser scale, it's a road we all must travel. It's called the road of 
encouragement. So in terms of discouragement or hardship, yes, to be sure, we can say to others, what a friend we have in Jesus. Can we find a friend so faithful? But as I heard or read one person saying to another, don't tell me I've got a friend in Jesus until I have a friend in you. Or I think of what some, something else a person said a hus- to a hospitalized patient. A, a chaplain had come to his room to see him and spend some quality time uh, with that patient. And towards the end of that visit and the conversation, the chaplain asked him, have you felt God's presence during your stay here in the hospital? To which the man responded, not until you came. What opportunities we have to be the loving, caring presence of Jesus to someone, to encourage others. And when we do, how we end up refreshing their spirit. The road to Horish is Jonathan's road. It's my road. It's your road to encourage someone. Let's pray. Dear gracious God, how precious friendships are and how precious it is when people come into our lives for the purpose of encouraging us. And thank you for opportunities we have every week in that every day to encourage someone else who needs to be encouraged. Help us, Lord, to travel the road to Horesh. Amen. been together in the sanctuary to worship our wonderful God and what a God it is whom we have worshipped. And now afterwards, uh, go to the back and get some refreshments, be refreshed 
by cookies and coffee and juice or lemonade, but be refreshed by conversations that we have together as we weep together and laugh together and hold hands and share our lives before the Lord. And I want to leave with you a wonderful verse from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope. Encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen.